welcome to another episode of Reading Rainbow. My name is Randall Fields, and I'm your host. And today we're going to be reading Shanghai Suka. It's about a boy who moved from Europe to Shanghai, and it's written by Heidi S- Smith Hyde and Jing Jing Song. Shanghai Suka by Heidi Smith Hyde, illustrations by Jing Jing Song. On his tenth birthday, Marcus found himself on an ocean liner headed for Shanghai. I don't want to go to China, he whispered to his parents. I want to stay in Berlin. But Berlin wasn't safe for Jews anymore. We need to go where we are welcome, Marcus. Mama said, "I know it won't be easy, but as long as we're together, we'll manage somehow. And there are other Jews in Shanghai." Shanghai was nothing like Berlin. In Berlin, the pavement did not melt during the hot summer months, nor did the streets flood. In Berlin, seven families did not share one room in an old apartment building. But Mama said to make the best of it, so they did. Every night she put flowers on the table. On Shabbat, they lit candles and recited the blessings. At the yeshiva in downtown Shanghai, Marcus met other Jewish boys his age. One weekend, Marcus and his friends were playing marbles in one of their neighborhood's narrow alleys. Marcus's marbles rolled too far. He chased after it, but someone else reached it first. A Chinese boy held the marble out to Marcus. "Thank you," said Marcus. He pointed to himself. "I'm Marcus." The boy smiled shyly. Liang. Marcus waved towards his friends. Want to play with us? Liang's smile grew, and he nodded. Although they spoke different languages, Marcus and Liang soon learned to communicate as only friends do. Yet Marcus missed his family and friends back home, as the harvest holiday of Sukkot drew near. He felt this loss even more. He thought of the beautiful sukkah his family always made, with fresh fruits and vegetables woven into the branches. Where will we build our sukkah this year? He asked his parents. The apartment building has no yard or garden. Can we use the roof? Nobody uses the roof. Marcus said, he was determined to perform the mitzvah of eating all his meals in the sukkah. My friends can help me make it. We'll build it out of bamboo. Two days before sukkah, Marcus. Liang, and the boys from Yeshiva gathered bamboo for the sukkah, using a saw Liang had borrowed from his father. They cut the stalks and loaded them onto a rickshaw. Then they collected shrubs and greenery for the eschal, the roof of the sukkah, as they worked. Marcus told Liang about Sukkot. We have a harvest holiday too," said Liang. "It's called the Moon Festival. There are games and moon-shaped cookies, and a lantern parade. We make red lanterns with special riddles attached. What kind of riddles?" asked Marcus. Liang smiled secretively. "You will find out soon." The Moon Festival begins tomorrow. The next day, Marcus and his friends built their rooftop sukkah. Together, they measured and cut and fastened. All the while, 
they sang songs from their old home to pass the time. It was a simple little sukkah with its slender bamboo poles and sparse roof. Here in Shanghai, where supplies were scarce, fruits and vegetables were for eating, not for decorating. My sukkah is so plain, I wish it were a little nicer, Marcus told Liang. I know how to make you feel better, said Liang. Come to the moon festival tonight with my family and me. We can march in the parade together. When darkness fell, Marcus followed Liang's family deep into the city where people of all ages were gathering. The streets of Shanghai exploded with wonder. Bright lights filled the sky. Look, a dragon, exclaimed Marcus, pointing to a paper creature that stretched from one side of the street to the other. Dragons bring good luck, explained Liang. Then Marcus noticed what looked like a bunch of bright stars twinkling in the distance. The parade of lanterns had begun. Liang led Marcus to a table covered with shiny red paper lanterns. Each lantern had a slip of paper attached to it. The papers have riddles on them, Liang told Marcus picking up a lantern. Let's see what this one says. He squinted at the words on the paper, then translated for Marcus. What adds light and warmth, even though you can't see it? Marcus thought and thought, but no answer came. What could possibly add light and yet not be seen? Come on, said Liang, let's join the parade. The two friends raced down the street into the sea of lights. At yeshiva the next morning, Marcus couldn't stop thinking about the riddle of the lantern. Rabbi, what adds light and warmth even though you can't see it? He asked Rabbi Kravitz, stroking his head. Beard, thoughtfully, Rabbi Kravitz said, Hmm, your question is a puzzling one, Marcus. How did it come to you? It came from a lantern that my friend gave me, Marcus replied. Rabbi Kravitz smiled mysteriously. Perhaps the lantern will light the way to the answer. At sundown, Mama said, It's time to recite the blessings, Marcus. Shall we go upstairs to the roof? Papa and I would like to see the sukkah you and your friends worked so hard to build. All right, Mama, but it's not, a nice, not as nice as our sukkah in Berlin, Marcus warned her. But up on the roof, Marcus's breath caught in his throat. There, glittering in the darkness, stood the little bamboo sukkah, covered in red paper lanterns of all shapes and sizes. Happy sukkah! cried Liang with a smile as bright as the full moon. Marcus gazed at the beautifully decorated sukkah, it was the best sukkah ever, but not just because of the lanterns. What made it special, thought Marcus, was the friend who decorated it. Marcus thought again about the riddle of the lantern. What adds light and warmth even though you can't see it? The answer, Marcus decided, was friendship. Historical note, 
In the 1930s, before World War II began, many European Jews felt that to ensure their safety, they needed to leave their homes. But they had nowhere to go. Most nations would not accept large numbers of immigrating Jews. But one country's doors opened wide. Between 1938 and 1941, thousands of Jewish refugees escaped by steamship to China. Chiun Sujihara, a Japanese diplomat, issued thousands of visas to Jews at the risk of his own career. Those visas, visas per permitted Jewish refugees to travel first to Japan and then to Shanghai. The Jews settled in Hong Kyu. Oh, well, I think that is uh, because I live in Shanghai. Uh, I'm trying to think where that could be. It could be Hong Kong. Okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's, it's Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is a district in Shanghai. It's not very poor now, but I guess it was poor before. Um, the Jews settled in Hong Kong, the poorest section of Shanghai, which came to be called the Shanghai Ghetto. Several families might share a single tiny rented room without lighting or indoor plumbing. The refugees endured diseases and too little food. The Hanko district in Shanghai became home to thousands of European Jews during World War II. Jewish refugees in Shanghai lived in crowded buildings like this one. Despite the difficult conditions, Jewish culture flourished along the narrow winding streets. It wasn't unusual to find Yiddish theater, coffee houses, synagogues, and schools. Newspapers and libraries were established, and Jewish holidays and cash crude were observed. I think it's cash root, cash root. There was even a yeshiva known as the Mira Yeshiva. Thanks to the efforts of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, soup kitchens and makeshift hospitals were also founded to assist Jewish refugees who arrived on China's shores. During a time when most countries looked the other way, China offered a haven, saving the lives of thousands of Jews from the Lithuania, Poland, Austria, Russia, and Germany. Many Jews lived in these buildings on the word, on the word street in Shanghai, shown in the 1939 photographs. So this 1939 photograph. Jewish refugees lived alongside Chinese residents in Shanghai. This is an interesting picture. Jewish residents of Shanghai, like these Hasidic Jewish men standing under a Chinese street sign, brought their traditions with them to China. Oh, very interesting. So Chinese and Jewish people alongside each other. Um, and I used to, my mentor used to be Jewish. He, his mother was the Russian Jewish and they moved to New York City uh, in the 1940s. Like late nineteen forties, I think. It could have been, it could have been earlier. Um and uh, yeah, and and you know I know a bit of the culture. And some holidays we're eating something called matzo ball soup. And then we had a time on Christmas, like every Christmas, he would invite me over. 
because I was an orphan. And um, he and his family ate Chinese food. And I asked, why do you eat Chinese food on Christmas? They couldn't really give me a definitive answer. Um, but I believe that it's most likely contributed, this most likely contributed to why Jewish people in New York City eat Chinese food. Because I think it's spe specifically to, I'm not really sure, but it might be specifically to to New York Jewish families. Not sure. But I have no doubt that this might have contribute, contributed to um, why Jewish people eat Chinese food on Christmas. So I hope you enjoyed this book. Please like and subscribe and help this channel grow and share if you can. And uh, so long. I have to I have to find a like a catchphrase at the end. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So um, see you guys. Thank you.